So we're out at Wee Jasper and um, uh, the people that have come out from Canberra were saying, well, how, if these things are so spectacular and of international significance, how come we've never heard of them? And uh, that's why we realised that the research collections hidden away at the ANU uh, are not accessible to the general public. So um, a lot of the stuff that we've done, I don't think it's done anywhere else in the world. And uh, indeed, when you, many of the items you see on display, uh, we've only seen in the last couple of months, we were printing things out with a 3D printer for the very first time in November for this display. And these are fantastic new uh, tools that we've got to um, aid us in the investigation of the history of life on the planet. Generally what we sit here is the fossil, or a rock, or whatever we're looking at. And this is a rotation stage, so the object has the ability to rotate around in 360 degrees, but just in a plane. And then on this end we have an X-ray detector, and this is one particular type. It's just like a CCD camera, right in that uh, uh, video camera there. But in, the difference is that it has a light-type window, uh, and then behind that light-type window, which the X-rays go straight through, is a scintillation screen. So that glows when the X-rays hit it. And it's that glowing image that the CCD films. Okay? So just in that straight configuration, I might put my hand there and I take, can take a radiograph of all the bones in my hand. Okay? Now the great advantage of X-rays, of course, depending on how energetic they are, they go through things and so you can, things become transparent. You can see structure and density variation based on how well the X-rays travel through those, that material block. The problem with a radiograph like that is if I take a radiograph of my, of my two hands like that, that is indistinguishable from a radiograph like that. So the problem with these, these objects becoming translucent for the X-rays is that you lose that positional information. You see where the position is in a plane, but not in depth. Having said that, if I rotate this 90 degrees, and I clearly resolve which hand was in front of which. So in our minds, we, we have done a tomographic reconstruction by rotating that around. We know these objects well enough that we can interpolate from that view to that view and understand that this hand was behind. And we know that intuitively, but we're doing a lot of processing to understand that, of course. That's uh, invisible to us. We've learned that it's applied. For all those fossils there, they're all transitional fossils in the sense of Charles Darwin, 1859, because Darwin had to explain why, if, he, if his evolutionary theory was valid, why weren't there all these transitional forms to be observed amongst uh, living animals? And he said, well, many of them are extinct. And it's the incompleteness of the geological record that explains why uh, we can't actually find many of these transitional uh, evidence of these transitional animals. Well, of course, 150 years after Darwin, if we've been running around in places where, like Burrenjuk, uh, finding all these new fossils, the question is, um, do we find things that are consistent with uh, Charles Darwin's predictions? And, of course, we do. So, we see this as incontrovertible evidence that life has evolved on the planet. And the other two uh, general points about the fossils that I need to, I think I've already said it, that these things haven't been seen anywhere else. Uh, you won't see a display like this anywhere else in the world. And I do know that some of the stuff we've just been doing over the last couple of months with these fantastic 3D printouts, I know none of our colleagues in some very well-funded research groups overseas <laughs> that study this stuff, they haven't done anything like this either. So you're really looking at things that you won't see at this time anywhere else. I'm sure they'll catch up to us soon, uh, but you won't see this sort of display an uh, anywhere else in the world. Wood, bone, whatever it happens to be, um, requires a particular algorithmic approach, a computer algorithm, which relies on a bunch of mathematics that takes every pixel in that radiograph uh, and tracks it as it rotates for 360 degrees. What the group tried to do about five years ago was get away from that mathematical limitation. And there had been some discussion in the scientific literature about how to tackle the problem mathematically. And we were able to uh, 
convert some of the mathematics to uh, in fact an exact algorithmic solution. Uh, so no longer do we use uh, a rotation in a plane, but the sample goes through a helix. And what that means is that every particle in the object describes a unique trajectory. And so we have one equation to describe one and not. So you have to realize that in this case, this is a four megapixel camera. It's not very big in terms of modern cameras. But it turns out to be an eight billion voxel, eight billion element volume. So that's quite a big chunk of data. Uh, that's about 16 gigabytes of data that we recover when we reconstruct the three-dimensional object. So that's, you know, that's, that's a pretty sizable memory stick even today, right? That's, uh, and we're doing that every eight hours. Um, not all on fossils. I'll talk about that in a moment. Um, so, as I said before, the, the voxels, the elements, the volume elements in the extremities of that volume are less distinct and geometrically a little bit distorted. But when we do this helical method, we can reconstruct the geometry exactly. And uh, so the, the, the light coloured stuff is the limestone, and this black bit, this is the dermal bone. It's called dermal, only forms in the dermis, that is in the skin. It can only form on the outside. And then on the inside are these thin black layers, and we call that perichondral bone, and that's part of the endoskeleton. So one of the key differences between these two types of skeletons is that the internal skeleton always forms first as a cartilage. So as you know, as, as we grow up, you know, when you're in your early 20s, things ossify and you don't get any taller. Um, but before that, the limb bones, which are a part of the internal skeleton, are actually largely cartilaginous and it helps things to grow. The growing outer surface, the perimeter of any cartilage is called the perichondrium. And that's, for some reason, these, ancient, these are ancient armoured fish, an extinct group that dominated the seas, rivers and lakes of the Devonian period and then completely disappeared. For some reason, they can only ossify this perichondrium and, and they didn't have any spongy bone in the middle. So there's some genetic control that prevented that from happening in this major group that lasted for 70 million years in the fossil record. Whereas, of course, our bones have a core of spongy tissue. So that's what we call an endochondral bone. That never developed in placoderms. So the space in there is the space that was filled with cartilage. But of course, cartilage being a soft tissue is very rarely preserved in the fossil record. So the guys in London, when they, when they realised what they had when they were etching these things out, they realised that they could actually infer the structure, the internal structure of the brain case, uh, because the brain case is part of the internal skeleton, basically a block of cartilage. They could infer that from these very delicate, uh, um, thin, sometimes paper thin or even thinner, layers of perichondral bone and to etch these things out. You, if you touch them with a paintbrush, they'll just collapse. You have to be extremely careful working with them under the microscope to actually embed these thin layers in plastic so that they can survive the rigours of uh, extraction and the fact that they've been enclosed in a rock for 400 million years and uh, therefore they really need some support. And uh, some of these things are on display or image in the in our exhibition. So that's actually uh, this is how we did uh, investigated these things before we had Tim doing the CT scanning. So you can look inside a skull if it was found with the roof weathered away. So we're looking at a skull from the top, and that's another one. So that's the right eyeball. We're looking down on two skulls, and the skull roof is weathered away. This is actually the external skeleton. And this is all internal skeleton with a brain cavity preserved. This one over here is another one where almost all of the skull has disappeared. And we've got all sorts of interesting things. I won't go into detail, but the semicircular canals of the inner ear, all the nerves, the pituitary vein, all, all of this detail we can see in these amazing specimens. This is a, a bed of gypsum, and it starts off as a shallow bed. And as the building progresses, it gets deeper and deeper. But the printing process always happens at the same level, so at this level. So this is the roller. It rolls out um, 100 microns, basically a sheet of paper thickness worth of gypsum. This is mm -hmm. just chalk, essentially. Mm -hmm. And then there's five inkjets that sit here, 
there's a binder and then some colours, black, and they print a single layer of that three-dimensional block. Okay? And because it's printing a slice, it can print colour at depth, effect effectively what becomes depth, because it can print anywhere on that slice, and that slice eventually can become covered up. So you get, you get, get the depth of colour, it's not just on the surface. Um, and then when it's finished, remember this block is just each layer prints, it moves down and then puts another layer and moves down. So that's to vacuum up the excess powder. So this gets recycled. And it's only where I've printed that you get the powder bound. powder is recycled and the object comes out covered in dust obviously. It's porous though, so you have an opportunity to soak in a resin and harden it up. So that, that's generally what you do. So what I do, I just remove that object, like that. You'll recognise it I hope. <laughs> I then put it into this um, uh, chamber which I can use compressed air in. So later on I'll sack that all up and put it back into the system. And then I select D powder, starts up a small air gun. Um, so they, I'll try and get my head out of the way so you can see. And you just blow off the powder like that. Most of you will recognise uh, the object, I imagine. One of the uh, Placoderm eye captures from the exhibition. Printed about five times the life size and in colour, Technicolor even. So. so, the interesting thing to note is that all the internal spaces are printed precisely. So the, the thin parts are on the back here, so if you don't press that, that's fine, but just pass it around it. That's quite quite yes. solid, you know? Yes, um, yeah, I'll, I'll show you something where I printed the, the replica, the internet. Yeah. Um, and it's um, magnified. Um, this is a... This is the ancient eyeball, so all of this stuff on the outside, that's the external skeleton here, that's the opening to the eye, when you turn it round, the inside of the capsule is here, and that is the what we call the eye stalk, so that's where the cartilage was still connected to the brain, which is a very uh, ancient feature of this thing. So, the, the uh, optic vein, that's the optic nerve and the optic artery, and these depressions here are for the, the eye muscles that move the eyeball around in its socket. The eyeball, the eye, so the socket in the skull, this thing was it sitting in the eye socket. This so it's unusual to have that preserved. Well, it's just not preserved anyway. And this would be the only one that's ever been found. Well, no, we've got it. Well, this was the first one that was found, just an isolated eyeball. We've now got some in some of the specimens where they're actually in the skulls. Um, so, but they're all from the Burrenjuk area. So that's what's unique about this. And there's something special about holding a, a 3D object. Mm -hmm. Now, I, I don't get yeah. the same feeling when I look at a computer screen, mm -hmm. but I can change the translucency and all those sorts of yes. things. If I'm trying to get a, an appreciation of the anatomy or um, how the functional form of something, I can't do it on the screen.